Okay, welcome, welcome everybody. Today we will be working on the Yoga Anatomy book with Leslie Kavanaugh and Amy Matthews. Uh, this book is commonly seen in yoga teacher trainings across the globe. Uh, I don't know of one that doesn't offer it. I'd be concerned if there was one that did not. So in our last session, we went through the standing postures and breaking down the primary movers of the standing postures and how those primary movers being muscles, connective tissue, so on, uh, are impacted by the modifications we choose to offer as yoga teachers and the cues we, we offer to help the practitioner move their yogic edge to, to begin to develop the posture further. So in, in this training, we don't so much uh, approach yoga in you know, getting to a posture or you're almost there or you, you'll have it soon, keep coming. Rather, can we explore what this posture can look like for each individual practitioner and allow that to vary from one to the next? And so that's, that's the lens in which I teach this from. And that might vary up from the way you look at uh, yoga teacher training. And that's, that's totally fine as well. So if you have the first edition of the book, head on over to 82. Uh, if you do not, you could head over to the table of contents and go to West Back Stretching because there's a Sanskrit guide and an English, English guide. So check out the English guide and go to West Back Stretching. And that's how you'll find this posture of the lovely Monica here demonstrating it in our photo shoot. So we're going to go over some key things today. One key thing that <clears throat> really sticks out to me is stretching the West and what this means to you. And, you know, some of you have heard this and some of you have not heard this. And so essentially when, when we break down Sanskrit as a whole, there's meaning to the words. And then those, those words are assembled together for a complete idea. And so when we talk about Pasha, it means behind, after, later, westward. Utana, in, intense stretch. And asana is like to take a seat. So if you were in India and you came to somebody's home and they spoke Sanskrit, they might say take an asana or actually take an asan because technically that A is silent. So for some, we work it out that way. For others, we do not. So pick your pleasure there. But understanding that when you're starting to approach the Sanskrit piece of it, which isn't really our focus here at EDGE, here at EDGE, we're more looking for what's happening within the body when we do the thing. And so whether that is expressed through an asana and primary movers and muscles or connected tissue, or if that's expressed through the neurological system and how it, how it can slow and regulate uh, the neurology of the body, um, how maybe some of the pranayama or the breathing exercises can impact the hormones that are being released in our body that may exude um, hormones of stress um, or discourse within the physical self. You know, whichever limb of yoga we're, we're playing with on any given day. On this day, we're playing with the third limb, which is asana. And we will begin with this posture. So west back stretching. So when we look at this picture here, we see in red, the primary movers. So this is, this is primarily what's going on with the practitioner in the seated forward fold. So what we have is if we had started off in a, a corpse pose or shavasana, and if we had done a roll up and then we had reached the hands to the soles of the feet, we would now be here. And in that process, any number of, of muscles would be engaged and fired and released as you move through it. But once you landed this far, we would see an expression of the erector spinae. And these are the muscles that run alongside the spine and hold us upright each day. They work so hard for us each day. And so if you do a fair amount of standing throughout the day, you might find your erector spinae are somewhat shortened because strong muscles become that way by shortening. And so when we contract a muscle, it shortens, but sometimes it gets stuck there. You can't really, can't really get it out of there, can't move it out of there. So when we come into a posture like this, the seated forward fold, it, it holds space for the erector spinae to lengthen and open up 
and hopefully give way to some of that tight tension that we see, you know, just from, from all the standing that we do. So as we carry on then through, the stretch continues on the glutes and the hamstrings and the gastrocnemius. And so I do not expect you to know the Latin names of the anatomy and I don't have no interest in that, but I do want you to have a general understanding of what fires when we come to this place and what changes when we offer various modifications. And as we break this particular posture down and we move our way through this book, I'll, I'll give some examples um, of each, although it would probably be a whole course in itself, which I might one day create uh, if we broke down, you know, the total scene of any given posture within this book. So, uh, but just to kind of give us a, an idea, a North Star, if you will. So stretching the West, stretching the backside. So that's what we're looking for. So that's that's fun flowery lingo to add into your yoga classes to help teach your practitioners what's the anatomy behind what I'm doing, you know, so that they kind of understand that a little further. Uh, commonly, we have tight hamstrings, and this is an opportunity provided we've not given the modifications of bending the knees and chosen something different instead. This is an opportunity for lengthening of the hamstrings. Um, tight hamstrings commonly prompt low back pain, low back tension, low back tightness. So to consider that, if you will, that what, what opportunities will I suggest to my yoga students in class for them to find their posture here. And so commonly it is bend at the knees and that's kind of the go-to and such. But since we also do know that the hamstrings tend to, tend to for some large portion of the population that is tend to be shorter than not, uh, I think that the practitioner would be more readily be served by not bending the knees and by keeping the legs straight and then finding their hands forward. So when I choose language here, I try and avoid language that sounds like towards the feet, at the feet, or if you can't do the feet, then use, you know, A, B, and C, and so on, right? So choosing language that just tells them what direction their hands are reaching towards, and that the emphasis in this particular posture happens to be keeping the legs straight. So that's the big takeaway on that one. Um, once we bend the knee, then that's a total game changer. You'll still see the stretch in the erector spinae, um, but you will lose it in the hamstrings. If you flexed the feet, you'll see more of a stretch through the calves. So I would rather see a series of flex and point the feet and toes in a posture like this than have a practitioner come down as far as humanly possible. And so one reason for that is falling, believe it or not, is, is really relevant in cause of death for people still. And one of the reasons for it is we live a sedentary life, we being the majority of the population, at least these days, sitting in a chair. And so the result of that is underdeveloped muscles from the knee down. And so if you can weave in some flex point, flex point, flex point, whenever you can, that's a great way to just pick up not only those primary movers, you know, from the knee down, but also the secondary movers, the smaller assistant movers, you know, so if you think about, you know, the team, you've got, you know, the quarterback and then all the other people that assist the quarterback in their goal, think about your muscles this way. So with your lower leg complex, you know, rather than the essence of this posture be reach the feet, you know, because some people feel like they have little T-Rex arms and they'll never reach the feet and maybe they won't. And that's okay. Maybe the time is better served by flexing and pointing instead. Um, a caveat to that instruction would be first and foremost, in any given posture, we want to find where the pelvis sits. And so we want the pelvis to sit um, nice and squared on the ground. We don't want one hip popping up over the other. That's so commonly seen. Uh, so that's something that we wanna make sure happens. And one way that could, that could help happen is if you were to take either a blanket or the, um, the top end of the yoga mat, you roll that up to say maybe four or five rolls so you have like a little egg roll and then invite your practitioners to sit upon that, that little egg roll that you have 
have created. We've now elevated the hips and in so doing, we've taken off quite a bit of pressure from not only the low back, but you know, the entire pelvis and everything connected and having to do with that. And it's just a really nice way for yogis to settle in. So I've done this with bolsters. I've done this with pillows. I've done this with rolled up blankets. The little yoga blankets are nice for this, which, you know, if they have them, that works. But in most cases, people have a mat. And so that's the prop that I'll tend to use. The other nice thing about that is wherever you're teaching, your prop is the mat. So I would, I would extend an invitation to say, hmm, where could I utilize the single prop that I have in various scenarios in your journey here during yoga teacher training, not even only today. So once hips are elevated, the practitioner may find that straightening the legs is far more accessible than it was before and less of a tendency to want to bend the knee. Now, let's say we're in a studio setting and, you're, and your students have a strap. So some different ways I've seen this done is um, keeping the strap uh, towards the, where the feet are on the mat so that when you reach to this place, the strap is in hand's reach. And if not, or arm's reach, I should say. Um, if not, then all the work you've done to cue the, the students into where you've got them thus far is then broken as you know they move out of it to go reach for their strap out of their bag or whatever. So there's going to be some organization required on your end uh, at the onset to make sure things are where they need to be. So when I set up a class and I'll just throw these little sprinkles in for you. When I set up a class, I'll typically they take the two blocks that you see in the picture. I'll put them at the top of the mat on either side, right and left. I'll take the bolster that you see in the picture and I'll put it on the top of the mat. And then I'll put the strap on top of that bolster. And so that way I can tell folks, all right, so let's go ahead and reach for our strap. It should be on top of the bolster or whatever that happens to be. So um, I have been fortunate enough uh, in my years to have someone intern in my classes. So they would come and they'd set this all up for me with the music and the lights and the candle and the essential oils rather than the incense stick, but that's another lesson. And then I just come in and it's ready to go. And it, it frees me up to be able to chit chat with the students prior to the class, find out anything I need to know, things they have going on and so on. Um, so uh, depending on what it is they need, will help you if you know your anatomy, help guide them into where it is, it might be ideal for them to go. Uh, so let's go ahead and flip on over to the next page here. Head to knee pose and breaking down the Sanskrit, Janu is knee, Shiras, to touch with the head. So where are we? What are we doing? What is it? Asan is the posture or seat. So here, what we see is very similar muscle usage as what we see on the previous picture, um, although less work within the glutes. And there's uh, more distribution of the muscles that are being used beyond the spinal extensors. So like the lats are impacted here where we didn't see that as much. And one reason for it is we can come down a little further, but we also have our belly, our, our foreheads further down, but our belly might be a little further away from the thigh and opening up the spine and creating more of a C shape that occurs from the base of the pelvis up through the forehead. And in so doing, it allows the practitioner to rest the elbows on, on the mat is seen here. And then the hands go wherever the hands go. And so I don't even necessarily personally cue that we're attempting to reach the feet here. That's not even really my mindset. But, you know, following along in this picture, what is rewarding for your students that arrive consistently and stick with their practice on a consistent regular basis is they'll, they'll have a measurement there, a benchmark from where their hands were to where their hands can be. And so illustrated in the book here with Amy, and this is actually Amy Matthews, and this is her sketch, which I, I find to be fascinating. Um, so she has her hands interlaced even beyond the sole of her feet. And so that's a, that's a, really, that's a really grounding, soothing action. Uh, if you look at the next page with it, 
if if the practitioner is there rather than using a strap or or with their hands um we'll see more engagement through the calf muscles if that foot is flexed than not so just depending on where the hand is and understanding where we want this posture to go so what i like to do is each month i kind of declare a a minor to the major. And so even in yoga teacher training, I do like right now we're zooming on anatomy and Jess and Dan just finished up their master class on assembly of the class and deep, deeper learning of, of yoga in general. And so have seasons within your class. And in this case, maybe this week, we talk about where the hand placement is going to go. And maybe next week, we have more emph emphasis on the bent leg and where that the sole of the foot is going to go if it's going to invite up to the inner thigh if it's going to come down above the knee or below the knee but not on the knee and even though we're not standing such as tree which i would hope that you know not to have your foot on the knee joint uh in tree that's so important uh, we also don't want to do it in seating because it's not as though the practitioner might take their knee out in a in a quick swift movement but over time and through time with the sole of foot against uh the knee joint that way with enough pressure can certainly cause an imbalance of muscles and throw things off so we want to make sure that the hands are above or i'm sorry that the sole of the foot is either above or below below the knee and that's that's always always and so that is mentioned every class for me um the other thing here too is where is the belly in relationship to the thigh so is the belly invites towards the thigh but it doesn't necessarily do so allowing the forehead to leave the knee because we're at head to knee pose but maybe the third week of the month you can opt to do that so we've been playing around with head to knee pose for the past two weeks today we're going to explore around it and see if we can swim around different ways that we can still enjoy that lengthening of the west you know we, we've taught them over the past couple of weeks what the west are and how we can play around with that in this way and so if we come forward to there's one one picture in particular that i really want to give you monica's beautiful photo shoot here all the different ways it can be done we're on kneeling uh, let me get this one for you. I know I saw it. I know I saw it. Do, 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 do. Okay, well, hey, perhaps not. Uh, okay, so if we can imagine here that rather than the head to the knee, maybe the hands are straight and the cue that we're offering is the palms of hands are on the earth and there's a straightening of the back a lengthening and and maybe even that could be expressed by you know the hips ground into the earth by lengthening through the spine creating space between each and every vertebra so we have vertebra and we have vertebrae and it's up to you for sure to know the difference. Finding a lengthening there and an, an opportunity to open up the shoulders and send them back, not in an awkward um, kind of way, but rather in um rather in a, a natural let's let's move, let's move towards um coming away from the rounding that we see in our day-to-day -day life. So let's say if we're holding our cell phones and we're hunched over and we're rounded, you know, that's going to show up in our posture and in aging through the years, it may, may be difficult to be undone. So considering things along those lines, you know, just weaving in different times and places in your class that we can reinforce the importance of, of, of posture. Uh, staying on this posture, moving a little deeper into the breathing part. So for some, the modification that we just gave a moment ago, we're coming a little way. We're making some space between the belly and the thigh. The emphasis is now on the straightening of the spine and sending the shoulders back and down. We've now created a little bit more space to work with some pranayama. 
So what I would love to see in a class is moving from that space to this space and back again and integrating that pranayama, that breath work in between. So we're forward here, or we're, we're fired up, we come up, we do some prana, pranayama, maybe two, three rounds or so, a few passes at that, then back, up, back down again, settle in for some time, and then back up again. If you work at this level, make sure you leave enough time for, for the posture to be fully expressed, settled into, and, um, and experienced. So we, don't, we wouldn't want to zip through, I would really say, any of these in something like a vinyasa flow, which traditionally is, is, is considered a quicker class, but know that it doesn't have to be. So really with a vinyasa flow, all we're doing is integrating our breath with our movement and back again. Although if you've seen it on a schedule at a, at a gym, you would assume this might be a more athletic class, which may or may not be true, depending on you, the teacher. So, okay, so moving on, a revolved head to knee pose. So here we are again. And what we start to have is more of a move, more of a stretch through the side body and away from the West, away from the back. And so again, as, as we open it up, we find that nice grounding that hopefully, you know, we've, we've gotten some of that in our forward fold here. And we start to see more work on the inner thighs, still some on the hamstrings and the, uh, and the calves, a little bit more in depth when you see the soleus also, also engaging there. And as she comes to the side, maybe she reaches her foot and maybe she doesn't, right? And, and it's not so much about that. It's, it's really where the arm wants to go in order to accomplish the side stretch. So these kind of seated postures can really help move the envelope in what students are able to do. You know, let's say in a standing series with something like extended side angle, for example, if you've given them some work to develop these muscles and muscle memory here while they're on the floor, then when we stand up, we're going to, we're going to see them be able to, to maybe do a little bit more standing than they were able to do seated. On the other side of it, it's a little less intimidating to do when it's standing um, for some. And so if they have some experience on, on doing extended side angles standing, then when they come to the seated posture, it might come a little bit more readily to them. So chicken or egg on that. So, so much going on here. This is such a, a, a um, well-rounded pose. We still have the glutes fired, but notice it's the medius and not the maximus being worked here. And this is really important when we consider the attachments and we won't go into the deep depth waters, well, perhaps, but of the pelvic floor and the crest of the pelvis, the bony structure that is the crust of the helmet, pelvis at the top, and the attachment of the muscles that, that attach to said pelvis. What we're looking for, and all you really need to know, is that we're trying for a nice balanced movement between the left and right side of the body, and also between the front and back side of the body. And that idea can be expressed over the course of a 60 minute class, right? So every posture isn't going to offer a 360 movement. And that's why we have these different postures to touch on everything. But the idea would be that at the end of your class, you've kind of, you've kind of touched on it all, although there may be some emphasis on some things rather than others. Uh, <clears throat> building into this posture, another great thing about it is the gracilis is fire. This is your inner thighs. In your adductor, Magnus is also fired. So your inner thigh structure, commonly seen, is underdeveloped for uh, the masses, let's say the masses. And so one byproduct of this is it can be a contributor to achy backs in that we may have really strong glutes and we may have really strong quads, the front of the thighs, and we might have really tight hamstrings in the back of the thighs. And then to workshop all that and hold it all together, the outside of the thighs might have more definition, leaving the inside of the thighs to be the least defined at all. And let me tell you why that's a thing. <clears throat> we want a nice balance surrounding that thigh bone. And so when we don't have that, what we tend to have is more of a tug and pull. Um, <clears throat> and we want to try and find a way where we can build up the muscles of the inner thigh. And when that happens, then 
then the outer thigh doesn't have to work so hard. And when we lengthen the hamstrings, then the quads don't need to be so quad dominant. Commonly, when we see quad dominant, we also see a tight low back. What's happening <clears throat> is the short hamstrings are tugging and pulling on, on, on the back side, on the west side, pulling it down, pulling it down, pulling it down. And the low back is responding to that trying to meet it, you know, moving closer to the earth's surface, but at the same time, still also hold the body upright at the same time. So if you consider that just logistically, if you were to take a little tower of toothpicks and have one toothpick in the center being the femur bone there, and then, you know, maybe build a teepee around that, um, <clears throat> around that femur bone, how could you get those toothpicks to stand and, and support one another without falling in either direction. So definitely oversimplifying a very complex idea, but as long as you get the message, I'm happy with it. So developing the inner thighs whenever possible, although be forgiving and understand that many students come into class not ready to go on that and we'll have some work to do. Uh, in this posture, we have more going on with the arms. We have the rhomboids, the lower trapezius, and latissimus dorsi. So our lats, more going on with the upper body here, which is really nice. And we also have some engagement on some of those intricate muscles throughout the body that maybe don't have a chance to be touched upon. If you're doing different postures, I would say, let's say maybe like if you're doing something um, standing, balanced posture, half moon, something like that. If you're, if you're reaching that half moon to the floor, you know, you have a little bit more of the side stretch, although we're, we're really looking for that to be assisted by a block so that there isn't a side stretch in your half moon. So continuing on, coming to a seated wide angle pose. So this is one of my go-to favorites. This is, I think, in almost all of my classes. Uh, when I start a class, uh, after greeting the, the students, um, I take some silent time. So I'll hand the class off to my assistant, whoever they are, you know, wh whoever set the room up and got things going and let their, them meander around and chit chat with the students and, you know, ask any random questions they may ask. And then I, I might go up front for just a few minutes and just find a, a quiet place and quiet my mind and kind of settle in for a little bit. And then I'll come to the class and I'll present. So depending on how you work, uh, this works well for me because it gives me an opportunity just to quiet my mind, to ground, to settle in, um, and then step forward into the work that I'm doing. So you'll want to find your own process and, and kind of build build your class around it. Otherwise, it can just be a lot going on where you walk in, maybe a student saw you before class, they're talking to you, you're not set up yet. Someone's asking about their passes or expiration dates or something, you know, along those lines, you know, and, and, and you want to, you want to really guard heavily that initial time prior to teaching a class to find yourself in a mindset of grounding. So this is commonly where I settle into that. So when I return to the room to teach my class, and some, some places of employment won't allow you to do this depending where you're teaching, but when I return back to my class, uh, by then the lights are low, the candles are on, the stage is set, and I'm ready to go. So that's my process for moving into an activity of, of anything in life. I do this every day in my life, you know, and so if you were in a comfortable cross-legged seated pose, for example, maybe you just took some nice rib cage rolls where your hands are on your knees and you're just kind of rolling around a bit, you know, maybe some neck rolls where we bring the ear to the shoulder and roll it forward to the other side and back again. We only want to roll the head forward, not back. Um, and then shortly thereafter, maybe some side stretches, um, but then you would see me come into this forward fold. And, and the reason for it is it's such a great, it's a physical opportunity for the hands to connect to the earth. And, you know, maybe in this case, Monica has her forehead on the earth, but maybe there's a block there, you know, that works too. Or maybe there's two blocks there whatever it takes to get the forehead to the earth, that will be the modification or the prop that I use because I am, I'm setting the stage for grounding. So let's, let's stop the movement for a moment. Let's ground in center. Let's take calming breath, a centering breath, and then we'll move into our practice. So in this way, uh, you know, not everybody uh, can express this posture. 
is seen on this picture or even in this book. So these are some different things that can be done. But ultimately, I do like to see the forehead on a surface of some sort uh, for the purpose and the reasoning that I've just described to you. So getting back to what's working then. So we're back to not only stretching the West, but then we're also developing the inner thighs. And hopefully, you know, the last, the last is on help teach you why we might want to go about doing this, the seated angle pose. So stretching and lengthening the inner thighs, giving them an opportunity to fire up and work. And it is nice too for practitioners who maybe don't have the muscular structure of the inner thighs there so much. Um, but as time goes on, as they begin to develop, they'll go home and they'll feel that the next day. And that can be really rewarding. I know for me, if I feel a little something the next day, it, it's, it can be an incentive for me to, to continue on and move forward with that. Uh, where the feet are going to go, how wide they're going to go is how wide they're going to go. And it doesn't really change up uh, the primary movers too much outside of the west side, you know, where in the glutes we have the work will will vary on how open we are in this place. Um, and all of that depends on the tightness of the hips. So I personally intend to have tighter hips than I wish I did. Um, and so therefore this particular posture, my feet would be a little closer together than splayed apart is, as seen by, by Monica or in the book as Amy demonstrates. Uh, you might also use an opportunity here to um, invite them to slowly and with like a milky um, slow movement point the toes and hold and then back again mindfully. But unlike our seated forward fold, I wouldn't have them flexing, pointing, flexing, pointing because we just have too much going on. So at a certain point, you want to look at the picture and say, okay, we have muscles that aren't used very frequently here that are commonly under underdeveloped. We have more, plane, more than one plane of the body being used. We have the inner thighs and then we have the backside as well, right? And as we begin to compound the different things any given asana could do, which is something like a side crane or a side crow would embody so much happening with the body, this is not the time to start pointing and flexing the feet. So, you know, thread those into the postures that don't have as much going on and your practitioners will thank you. So, okay, so let's move on to bound angle pose. We see this in different ways and different people take it in different ways. Um, essentially, we see again with Amy uh, in the book or with Monica in the picture, we see again a lengthening of the gracilis and the adductor magnus, so the inner thighs and so on. So this is nice. In this, in this book, Amy takes the opportunity to bring it forward. So that's, that's a progression that you can offer. So in the manual at edge, you see modifications and you see qualities. And essentially what that breaks down to is progressions and regressions. So we can progress it with a quality and we can regress it. We can bring it back with a modification. So in your mind's eye, when you see pictures such as this, you want to give yourself a definition of, oh, this is a progression of bound angle pose. And as you begin to develop your understanding of those things, then the sister postures available to folks can go a long way. So one reason why I love to see that integrated into a class is it really helps make it an all levels class. So if you started off where, you know, everybody take a comfortable cross-legged seat and move them through that idea. And then, you know, it might feel better for you to invite the soles of the feet together. For some of you not, and leave it at that. Don't have preferences built into the connotation of your voice. Truly empower your student to make a de decision based on the buffet of things that are available. So here we have Amy and, and Monica both with the soles of the feet together and the hands reaching to the feet. Sometimes the students will begin to round the back and we're working against that posture thing that we're trying to accomplish some. And so it might be better for them to bring their hands either into like a gasso or hands together in prayer or <clears throat> the hands to the thighs. A word on lingo. Depending on the class that you're teaching, you wanna be really mindful of the language that you use. So words like hands in prayer or take a gasso, they have religious undertones. And if you are teaching a class at a temple or at a church or something like that, then I would embrace and develop your language skills there. If you are teaching uh, yoga 
in a high school, I would invite you to find other ways to say the same thing, you know, hands together or whatever, um, finding, um, finding your language that your, your students come to know that is relative, relative to the setting that you're at is, is really important. So just considering that. So, okay, so similar muscles being used. Now we, now we come forward into a fold. This is something that is so grounding and so lovely. It could have been accomplished in the previous pose if the forehead met the earth. Um, but let's say you're teaching a series. Let's say um, it's a grounding series. We're just helping our students ground. Then I would absolutely invite them to come forward as much as it feels together. But I would, I would walk, I would step into it. So it might sound something like this. So let's come into a seated posture and open up our chest nice and wide. Close our eyes. Take a nice soft centering breath, inhaling through the nose. Feel a release through the jaw. Ground those sits bones into the earth and allow the knees to fall open. Maybe your hands reach towards your feet or your thighs or your heart center, whatever feels right for you. Moving through this breath, can you settle into this place? Inhaling and exhaling. Let's invite the chin to the chest and just breathe with our eyes closed, gaze downward, and slowly begin to invite the chin down as you snake your spine round into a C shape, stopping wherever you want to stop prior to any kind of pain, finding that yogic edge, that yogic edge is that place before pain shows up, not after, and just be there for a bit. You may find in your journey down that you might wanna take a pause and just experience a space before you move on to the, the, next, the next big movement. Let's see if we can find many movements, small mindful movements in many places. And coming down, staying here for a time. Can you find the grounding here? Can you find a softness on your brow and forehead? Can you relax the ears, back of the head and neck, shoulders, chest, chin, jaw? Can you release the tongue from the top of the mouth? Can you allow the legs just to relax into this? Feeling grounded and supported as the hips connect to the earth in this posture, create as much space as you like. You may have your hands where they were before, or you may bring your hands to the floor or anywhere else that feels right for you today. All I'm looking for is for you to create some space for us to do a little bit of breath work here. So let's find some centering and just inhale through the nose and feel the expansion of the lungs in the front and back of the body. And can we take as much time exhaling as we took Inhaling into this posture. Let's play around with the rhythm of that. In your mind's eye, in your eyes closed, can you visualize a jellyfish moving through the water, expanding open with each gentle breath and closing softly with each gentle breath? Perhaps if there's been something going on in your life, that's been weighing heavily on you. Maybe take this opportunity to take a nice deep cleansing breath in and exhale that out and just release that and make that choice in this moment. To just take your next breath, one of joy, gratitude for what you have as it is in this moment. Continue on inhaling and exhaling this way. Let's slowly back out of this, coming the way we came, chin to the chest. And while seated, begin to ragdoll up in any way that feels good for you, but being mindful to keep that low back nice and supported. You might even want to release the placement of your feet as you do. 
Can we keep the attention on the inhale and exhale as we do this ragdoll up? Can we exhale and wring out like a cloth, if you will, any residual stress that you may have been holding on to, letting that go? Creating a blank canvas for the new moment ahead of you. As you work back into your seated position, wherever that is for you, with your eyes closed, let's take one last centering breath, inhaling through the nose. Feel that trace its way through the back of the throat, along the spine rounding through the hips and sits bones and send that breath to mother earth, giving away anything that may be holding on, letting that go and replenishing the body with a nice deep inhalation, opening up the heart, heart center, softening the shoulders as you do, releasing any tension, washing it all away. And as you slowly begin to open your eyes, allow your hands to fall side alongside you and simply be in this moment. For those of you that want to, you can bring your hands overhead, the palms to meet, inviting the hands down to heart center. Take this one moment, this light bow, namaste.